Hello, we're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Maximizing Sensitivity, the Impact of BSI CMOS and Image Processing in Scientific Imaging. I'm Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you by Photometrics. Founded in 1978, Photometrics is an established industry leader in designing award-winning, high-performance scientific cameras. Photometrics maintains its leadership role with the release of Prime, the first and only S-CMOS camera to provide built-in computational intelligence for image restoration, and more recently, the Prime 95B, the first scientific CMOS camera to offer 95% quantum efficiency. Photometrics also offers comprehensive OEM support. More information is available on the company's website at photometrics.com. So let's get started. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. You can post questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the Q&A box, which will open when you click the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at lower left. I now present today's speaker, Ratchet Mohindra, the product manager for life science research cameras at Photometrics. Ratchet has been intimately involved with the development of scientific-grade BSI CMOS cameras that have made a significant impact in single molecule detection and super-resolution microscopy. His experience in managing the design intricacies of award-winning CMOS and EMCCD cameras has given him a unique perspective on emerging light detection technologies and their expected impact on life science microscopy. Ratchet Mohindra will now begin his presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. <clears throat> uh, we'll be going through uh, cameras and really how to maximize the sensitivity and get the most out of uh, the cameras and the products that are available for imaging. And so to give you just a quick background behind Photometrics, we are a digital camera company founded in 1978. So we are coming up to year number 40 next year. Uh, we're based in Tucson, Arizona which is really known for uh, its impact in astronomy. And that's actually where Photometrics started out with imaging. And it turns out that there's a lot of similarities and commonalities uh, between uh, imaging in the sky and imaging within cells. Uh, they're both low light situations where the camera performance and the sensitivity is, is, is a very key factor of, of, of the performance and the requirements. And over the years, we've done a wide range of cameras and leveraged many different sensor technologies, CCDs, uh, EMCCDs with their, you know, basically the most uh, sensitive cameras around. And now uh, over the last probably seven to eight years, uh, scientific grade CMOS cameras. Probably through about 2010 or so, uh, CCDs were the preferred imaging technologies. And this was definitely reflected by all the cameras that were available at the time. And not just from photometrics, but from the majority of uh, scientific imaging camera companies at the time. The, the way that CCDs worked, they were fantastic at low light imaging. They provided the performance that was necessary. Um, but there was a bit of a trade-off that you had to make. If you pick the sort of three main performance requirements of a, of a camera, those being the sensitivity of the camera, the resolution, and the speed, CCD cameras required you to effectively pick two of those three, the third being the, the, the trade-off that you had to make. Simply, if you wanted a very fast, very sensitive camera, that typically meant you needed very large pixels and not very many of them uh, so that you could image you know, with a lot of sensitivity and very quickly. And they provided enough versatility for a large variety of these applications, um, especially for cellular imaging. But as technology progresses, uh, things get better. And in 2009, 2010, 
SCMOS technology arrived, and SCMOS just stands for Scientific CMOS. Um, and SCMOS cameras, or, or the sensors used in these cameras, uh, effectively re removed the requirement of having to make a trade-off. They gave you a significant improvement in the performance, and they gave you the ability to have both resolution, or sorry, not both, all three, uh, resolution, speed, and sensitivity in, in one camera package. And it effectively made it very, very simple. Uh, you went from a CCD camera, the, the most popular being about 1.4 megapixel, to the most popular CMOS camera being 4 megapixels, you know, almost three to four times more uh, pixels. Uh, you went from 10 frames a second to 100 frames a second. You're now 10 times faster. You know, the time resolution that you're able to achieve just was an order of magnitude better. And the noise levels dropped significantly, allowing you to detect dimmer and dimmer signals. But the, the one sort of limitation that uh, was, always, was still in place was that the sensitivity was only slightly improved. Uh, yes, you didn't have to choose between you know, resolution, speed, sensitivity, because they matched the CCD or were significantly better. But EMCCDs, or these large pixel, very high efficiency, very sensitive cameras were still preferred for applications where you needed that sensitivity, where you were imaging very, very dim samples and modules. And to, to give you a bit of a comparison uh, of the improvements that you were able to achieve when you went from CCDs to SCMOS cameras, uh, here we have uh, an Argolite slide that's basically a pattern that you can, it's a slide that you can put on your microscope and image this pattern that gives you a, a quantitative comparison of the, the difference in sensitivity. And the way that we've done the comparisons throughout the slide deck, we were using a Karen twin cam with a 50-50 light splitter uh, with both uh, types of cameras in the comparison being used so that each camera was getting 50% of the available light off of a microscope. And as you can see here, the SCMOS camera is just providing uh, you know, better contrast, better signal to noise uh, than the CCD cameras were able to offer. One of the interesting things when I was uh, analyzing this, this image is the maximum signal measured by both of the cameras was effectively about the same. But the big difference being that because the noise levels were lower with CMOS technology, you, the result was a better looking image, better contrast, better signal to noise. And so sensitivity plays a big key as well because the, the signal difference there was the same. And so it doesn't really take a CMOS technology which offered significant improvements to a point where you can use it for extremely low light imaging. And so since 2010 when SCMOS camera technology was first uh, introduced, there have been improvements that have been made over the years to improve this sensitivity. And so one of the main factors of sensitivity is, is simply how much light is reaching the light-sensitive area of the pixel. Any impediment, anything along the way that either blocks the light or reflects it away uh, will reduce the sensitivity or the ability of the pixel to detect that light. And so the first one being fill factor. Uh, this is simply how much of the pixel area is sensitive to, to light. And you can see my very high-tech uh, image there. But if you take that circuitry area and you reduce it, now optimize the two-dimensional design of the pixel, you can maximize this fill factor, uh, reduce the area taken up by the circuitry, and you have more area to detect the light. And this first initial step took SCMOS cameras from about a 55 to 57% quantum efficiency or sensitivity and increased it to about 72%. So it was, it was quite, a, quite a big increase there. And what we saw as, as camera companies was a big shift from these initial 55% sensors to the new 72% sensors. Now, the way that this was done is the circuitry was made smaller by removing a transistor. So instead of you know, making the design smaller, it was more that functionality was taken out. And so the 55% sensors had global shutter, 
uh, and the 72% sensors only had rolling shutter. And initially at the time, this was a bit of a concern because uh, people worried about you know moving artifacts and whatnot affecting the, the image quality. But when you have a sensor that runs at 100 frames a second, it was quickly demonstrated that this really wasn't much of a concern. And so taking a 55% uh, quantum efficiency camera with the, the reduced uh, or with uh, with a lower fill factor and comparing it to the 72%, there's uh, there's a definite increase of quality that you're able to see in the image quality here. Uh, on the left side, we have the Q Imaging Optimos camera with a 55% uh, SCMOS camera compared to the Prime SCMOS with the 72% sensor. And other than the obvious change in the field of view, uh, the quality of the image is better. You're able to get uh, better contrast and overall about uh, when comparing the intensities, there was about a 25% increase in sensitivity. And so, you know, it clearly demonstrated that improving fill factor, improving the two-dimensional area of the pixel was having, was having a benefit in sensitivity. And while 72% is nice, uh, as people who develop technology and continue to push the performance of our cameras and detectors, uh, the quest was really on to continue to improve this. EMCCDs of you know, greater than 90% to 95% efficiency, and it's sort of the, the standard in terms of where you want to get to with your sensitivity. And so the, the next step of improvement really came with trying to optimize the, uh, the three-dimensional efficiency of a pixel and being able to detect the light. And so with a lot of the metal wiring and other structures of the sensor that might also potentially get in the way of uh, being able to detect light, most sensors use what we call micro lenses, uh, lenses that are very small that cover the pixel that are used to angle the light towards the photodiode um, to effectively angle the light around any of the, the impediments or blockages towards uh, being able to detect the light. And by improving this microlensing design, by removing the gaps between them, you're able to increase this efficiency and angle more of the light towards that photodiode around you know, the metal wiring and structures in, in the pixel. And this allowed uh, the quantum efficiency to take another jump from about 70% to 82%. But interestingly enough, uh, while when, 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 you do, when we did the standard quantum efficiency tests, what we found is that, yes, you know, we were able to measure this 82%, uh, this 10% increase in sensitivity. But when it came to microscopes, microscopy, where light tends to be very parallel, the, the improvements are actually quite minimal. Uh, there's less you know, uh, light at the, at the periphery of the pixel that can be reflected down to the photodiode. And so... When we do the side-by-side -side comparison, what we find is that there is less of an improvement. Uh, we're talking 2 to 3%, if that, when comparing the 72% SCMOS camera to the 82% SCMOS camera with the improved microlensing. And so uh, it was really nice to be able to say, hey, look, we've taken another big jump in sensitivity, but... The unfortunate situation was simply that the real world results didn't quite present this this improvement that that many people expected, and so you know, the the quest and the chase for this near perfect sensor continued. And as we continue to use uh, EMC CDs as our you know near perfect sensitivity um, sensor, they're able to achieve this by using backside illumination or back illumination, and they've been doing this since. Uh, 2001 or so, and the question has always been, especially once as CMOS cameras came out, is why don't we do the same thing to CMOS cameras? Why don't we backside illuminate these sensors to get a significant significant increase in sensitivity? And so back thinning or backside illuminating a CMOS sensor was by no means a novel idea, but even, even if it was a common, common sense thing to ask, it's still difficult to do and still a challenge. And so it wasn't until, you know, probably about last year or so 
that a backside illuminated CMOS sensor was was available. And it's very dependent on well as the pixel design because you effectively have to design the pixel upside down, uh, place all the circuitry behind the photodiode, behind the light sensitive surface. And what this allows you to do is you get a 100% fill factor and there's no angular dependencies which were which limited us when we went from the which we which limited us with the improved microlensing and so you are able to achieve this near perfect 95% quantum efficiency now photometrics was the first company that came out with or I should say the only company to date to come out with a back illuminated CMOS camera the prime 95b and uh, there's the quantum efficiency curve there, which you can see gives you uh, a significant increase in sensitivity across you know, the, the whole range of wavelengths there. But it's, it, it's not just as simple as now that we've achieved 95% quantum efficiency, uh, cameras are perfect and there's no room for improvement. What it really allows you to say is cameras are exceptionally sensitive. And this offers a significant amount of advantages. You can use lower excitation on your samples. You know, there's less phot phototoxicity, or you could maintain them, get better signal to noise. Uh, because you have this 95% efficiency of signal detection, you can lower your exposure timer uh, and get capture faster dynamic events. The, the 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 sort of other part of it that that people don't realize as much is simply now that the cameras are so sensitive. Um, you know, 95% with EMC CDs, 95% with uh, back backside illuminated CMOS cameras, and you know, 80% with with the front illuminated, if you will, as CMOS cameras. Uh, it allows you to focus more on your experimental requirements and the optical setups, and adjust and tweak your detector requirements around the spatial resolution that you require. Or what is the typical magnification that I use, and how do I maximize my sensitivity at, at at that magnification? And so let's do a comparison between you know, the, these three technologies: an EMC CD, the Prime 95B, and the front illuminated SCMOS cameras. And so you'll see, you know, the quantum efficiency, and there's differences in the sensor, but they're all extremely sensitive in terms of quantum efficiency. They all have very low read noise. They're all, you know, 67, 70 frames a second or faster. But the biggest key difference between them is really that the pixel sizes are different. And this will have uh, a big impact on your optical setups, your detection capability, the field of view that you are able to image with, with these sensors. And so the reason that this pixel size becomes so important, and especially towards sensitivity, is uh, think think of them like buckets. Uh, historically, we've always used this bucket brigade or buckets to represent pixels. And simply, the bigger the 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 bigger the bucket, the more uh, signal or water, or however you want to describe it, whichever analogy you would use, the bigger the pixel, the more signal you are able to detect in, in that pixel. And so, what we have here is just a comparison of the pixel areas. Uh, and so on that first table there, comparing the, in, by comparison, extremely large pixel of an EMC CD to the large pixel of the Prime 95B, which was, uh, which is an 11 micron pixel, you'll see that the, the EMC CD pixel is almost just over twice as large as the 95B pixel. And that simply means that if you did a side by side comparison with all optics and everything else being the same, the EMC CD would come out as twice as sensitive. Now that last column there, the sensitivity difference, that's just another column that I added in to uh, also account for the difference in quantum efficiency. So if you look at the, the last table at the bottom where we compare the Prime 95B to the SCMOS camera, you'll see that there's almost a 3x difference in pixel area, but another increase in sensitivity because we're going from this 80% quantum efficiency to 95%. And so again, if you did a side-by-side -side comparison between 
the Prime 95B and the front illuminated CMOS cameras, you'd see about uh, you know three to three and a half times more sensitivity with the Prime 95B. Now, when you actually do the comparison, uh, the numbers bear out the, the differences that you see. Uh, we had a customer here actually in Tucson, Arizona, where, where we go to test our cameras sometimes, uh, that were imaging these, uh, I believe they're neurons in mice, and they were trying to detect these spines growing. And they, they have all three, all three types of technologies, which is why this made, made, made this so interesting. They had an EMCCD, they had the 82% SCMOS, and we showed up with a Prime 95B to do a comparison. And what they told us is simply, we tried the EMCCD, and while it was extremely sensitive and we had fantastic signal to noise, the pixels were just too large for us to be able to properly resolve these spines growing on uh, the, these dendritic spines as they grew. So we switched to the 82% SCMOS, which was at that time the next best option. And while where they were now able to get the resolution to see them growing, uh, they weren't able to get the signal to noise that they needed. And the reason it was so important to them was the phototoxicity to these cells. When one of the cells started to, to die, the whole slide was effectively no longer useful. And so with the Prime 95B, with an 11 micron pixel where you're getting you know, three and a half times more light per pixel at, at that same magnification, they were able to find this perfect balance between the sensitivity and the resolution. And that's one of the key parts is being able to take the camera technology available to you and optimizing it specifically for your, your experimental setup. And so doing that side-by-side -side comparison just with, with the other cell that we have here, because I use this throughout the, the slide to give you a comparison point, you do see uh, a significant increase in sensitivity and contrast. Uh, part of this being uh, due to the quantum efficiency, but a significantly larger part being due to the fact that the pixel size is larger. But you cannot just have giant pixels. All right, right? That's where EMCCDs kind of uh, become limiting because you're spatially subsampling. You're missing the finer features. Uh, that customer was not able to image the, the dendritic spines as they, as they grew. You need to be able to resolve these features. And so the, the magnification and the optics that you use are, are a key part of the experimental setup and something that you definitely have to consider when, when choosing a camera for, for your experiments. And so typically for microscopy, we define the maximized spatial resolution that you can achieve uh, by, by, the op by the NA of your objective, but also depending on the magnification and the pixel size of the, of the sensor or camera that you're using, uh, you can tailor the camera to your optical setup. And so looking at that table there, with a 60x magnification, the pixel size of an SCMOS camera happens to be almost the perfect size to maximize your resolution uh, at 60x. And similarly, the 95B becomes the perfect camera for the 100x magnification, and then EMCCDs work out for 150x. And so if we take these three sensor technologies at the appropriate magnification for them to, to maximize the spatial resolution, how do they then compare? And so pixel sensitivity at Nyquist shows that the difference in pixel size is very, very negligible at the appropriate magnifications. And so they have a very small effect in your overall sensitivity. And what you find is that the quantum efficiency, the, the actual efficiency of the pixel, regardless of the pixel area, is having a significantly larger impact um, on your sensitivity. To, to, to kind of give you this comparison, when you compare the EMCCD camera at 150x to the Prime 95B at 100x, now they're both at microsampling, they're maximizing their spatial, resolu or their spatial resolution, you can see that the sensitivity between them is effectively the same. Now, there are other downsides to EMCCD technology, you know, the, the amplification of shot noise and whatnot that the Prime 95B doesn't have, 
And so overall, it makes it you, you end up getting better signal-to-noise ratio. Um, but because you're also using uh, 100x magnification compared to 150x, the actual image that you capture with the Prime 95B is that. And you're getting a significantly larger field of view while maintaining the same resolution and while maintaining the sensitivity. And so it really becomes key to, to design your experimental setup and optics and choosing your camera based off of you know, your requirements. If you're typically at 100x, the Prime 95B becomes the, the, the best option to choose. But, you know, the natural question then becomes, it, what, is, what is the best option for me at 60x? Because uh, you've just told me that quantum efficiency plays uh, a key role in, in, in maximizing my sensitivity at the right magnification. And you also told me that the 80% sensor uh, performs much more like the 70% sensor, though the micro lenses aren't having as big of an effect. And the answer to that is really just you have to have a small pixel back illuminated camera. And for the Prime DSI, which, which we announced about a month and a half ago, uh, provides you this, a 95% back illuminated, backside illuminated CMOS camera with effectively the same pixel size and resolution and performance as the current generation, or I should say now previous generation of SCMOS cameras. And so the Prime BSI is able to offer you that 100% fill factor and 95% efficiency and becomes optimized specifically for the 60x magnification. And similarly to the other curve showing the, the increase in sensitivity from the Prime 95B, the Prime BSI, which is the, the dark blue curve in this image, um, shows you that you're getting a significant improvement in sensitivity across a large, you know, uh, uh, wavelength range. With an interesting little bump out in the UV, which people tend to be interested in every now and then. And doing the side-by-side -side comparison uh, between the 82% camera and the backside illuminated Prime BSI uh, with the 95% with the quantum efficiency, you are now able to achieve the same spatial resolution at 60x. You are able to not have to trade off on that field of view, but you are also about 10 to 10 to 20 percent more sensitive. 30% uh, if you expect the 80% camera to, to behave much more similarly to the 70% the front illuminated cameras. And so the Prime BSI becomes a drop-in replacement for all of the existing SCMOS cameras out there because your optical design doesn't have to change. Uh, the experimental, experimental setup that you may have already optimized for that pixel size, or if you consistently use a 60x objective, it, it, this camera becomes a drop-in replacement to give you a 30% improvement in your overall sensitivity. And so now, when designing your, your system or your experiment, the, the, the efficiency or the sensitivity of the camera isn't really your biggest concern anymore because you have three options that provide you this near-perfect 95% quantum efficiency. And so I, I mentioned this chase to continuously improve our cameras and their performance. And we, we've effectively gotten to a point where we have near-perfect sensitivity for a variety of cameras for a variety of magnifications. And we've, we've effectively allowed you to remove that as a significant concern, if you will, from your experimental setup. So the next question really becomes, what now? And as camera manufacturers, what can we do with camera technology to allow you to get more out of it? And part of it is simply, we know the image data coming into the camera, and we have all of that information available to us. And we can leverage that information to extract as much information out of it as possible. Um, the first example being Prime Enhance. This is a denoising algorithm that evaluates the image data as it's coming in. And based on that data, it can reduce the impacts of shot noise. 
uh, increase the quality and clarity of your acquired images. And the result, in, the result being your signal-to-noise ratio increases by a factor of three to five. Now, I will clearly state we're, this is processing your data. This is done real time on the camera. It's a feature that you can enable or disable, so it's not something that you have to use. But as soon as you mention you're, we're processing data, there, there's, there are a few concerns that, that do come up. Um, the first one being simply, what are you doing to my data? How is this affecting the quantitative nature? Uh, are, are, are the features I'm using going to be blurred? Is this just like a median filter? And, and the answers to that are simply, A, it's quantitative, and it's preserving the intensities while just removing the shot noise or variation along that measurement. It's an algorithm that will maintain the finer features of biological samples. And lastly, uh, we didn't want this algorithm to be a black box. Image data goes in, black box does some work, and then improved signal-to-noise image comes out. It's a published algorithm that was invented at the INRIA Institute and tested out in collaboration with the Institute Curie in France and is a published algorithm with the title of the publication being, you know, literally denoising fluorescence microscopy image sequences. And the, the results uh, speak for themselves, really. Uh, we have uh, <laughs> this comparison here where we take a camera, we turn the feature off, and we, we took the image, and then we turn the feature on without changing anything, and we retook that measurement. And the, the graphs that you see there are the two measurements laid upon each other. Uh, we took the intensities, we converted them to photoelectrons, or the electrons detected by the sensor. And what you can see is that the mean intensities, the average intensities detected, are maintained. And it is primarily the fluctuations or the noise along that measurement that is reduced. And so you are able to significantly increase the quality of your images, increase the contrast that's available to you. Um, but yes, we are also processing the data. And so there will be a reduction in your frame rate. Uh, the sensors are capable themselves, without any processing, uh, of being able to do 100 frames a second full frame. With this feature enabled, you're limited to about 20 to 30 frames a second, which generally we find is, is still plenty fast enough for imaging you know, live cells. And so we've seen, we've seen a, a lot of improvements of, of imaging quality while using this uh, prime enhance or denoising algorithm. And uh, even in ways that we didn't expect initially, uh, we found that people have uh, attempted to use Prime Enhance with super-resolution microscopy as well, and found that uh, you're able to increase the, uh, your localization precision if you acquire your data with this feature turned on. Well, and I should say there's indications of this. Uh, and we do have a... Uh, a reference or a paper that is available on our website at photometrics.com if you do have you know, more questions about this. But as I'm, as I'm talking about super-resolution microscopy and when you're talking about 95% sensitive cameras, uh, single-molecule imaging or super-resolution microscopy becomes an obvious place to, to consider these cameras. And so we've also implemented a feature called Prime Locate which is now on its uh, second iteration or second generation. Uh, and Prime Locate is effectively an application-specific uh, compression algorithm. So it's, it's, a, it's an intelligent compression algorithm specifically for super-resolution microscopy. With super-resolution, uh, where you're imaging you know, many thousands of frames of single molecules, the background is typically not information that is required. You really just want the single molecule intensities. And if you're able to evaluate the image data for what is background and what is a single molecule, uh, what Prime Locate will allow you to do is transfer only the single molecule data to the computer. So the way that it does this is simply, it assumes that the background is static. Anything in the background that's not moving, it, it takes a set number of frames that is continuously updating, and it removes that from the processing requirement. And so now that you've taken this static background away, uh, you're looking at only the dynamic events. 
And these dynamic events, uh, it will evaluate to see if they're dynamic single molecule-like events. And if they meet that criteria, the single molecule, a region around the single molecule was transferred to the computer. So the goal for us was simply don't do the localization because everyone chooses or prefers to use their own algorithm. So we transferred the single molecule with all of its own original intensities uh, to the computer without any of the background information. And we found that we get about a 70 to 80, 85 uh, percent compression of the data, allowing you to A, save the amount, save the space on, on your computers. And, and secondly, it also increases the localization processing speed, the, the localization speed, because there's less filtering that's required. The background is zero everywhere except for where the single molecules were. And so you're able to achieve a higher efficiency overall and reduce the amount of time that it takes to localize these uh, you know, 10 to 20 to 60,000 frame stacks. And so as, we're, as we've been demonstrating prime locate and using it for, for single molecule, or sorry, for super resolution microscopy, the, the natural question that followed is, if you're able to find these single molecules and separate them from the background and only transfer those, can you use this same implementation or the same framework to be able to track the molecules as they move across the frame? And you know that got us thinking and that got us working on uh, real-time particle tracking on the camera. And so similarly to locate, the, the camera evaluates what is background, what is static, what is not moving, and then we'll evaluate the image data for single molecule-like particles and track those across the frame. Now, the key difference here uh, between uh, locate and the particle tracking is that the goal is not compression. The goal is not to help you with your data management. The goal is to allow you to do your experiment. And while the experiment is running, being able to evaluate things like, am I getting the expected number of particles in a frame? Are they moving at a rate that I expect? Uh, are, are they moving at all? Um, uh, how, how far have they traveled? And, and it gives you the ability to evaluate your experiment as it's running, as opposed to most of the time with particle tracking, where you need to acquire the data, have your stack of data, and then go analyze and post-process it later. And so, any time that you have to run an experiment, analyze the results, and realize I need to rerun this experiment, that, that can be a big time sink. And so being able to evaluate this data as it's happening and making sure that you're getting the activity as expected can save you a significant amount of time. Now, I also mentioned that the goal of this is not compression. And what I meant by that is we're, we, we transfer the whole frame, the whole image. Uh, so the frame data will include, will include the background. It won't be zeroed out. It will include all of the particles. But the information transferred with the frame will also include you know, ID numbers with each particle. It will include the historical information of the particle. And all of this information is, is, is transferred so that when you do eventually uh, do the uh, post-processing for the particle tracking, all of the information that would have been available to you previously is still there. And so it becomes, it really becomes a tool to, to allow you to ensure that, yes, my experiment is running as expected, and then still go do the analysis as you would have otherwise. But increasing the, the efficacy of your experiment by allowing you to say, I don't need to go rerun this at a, at a much later time. Now, similarly here, uh, we didn't want this tracking algorithm to be a bit of a black box, and so it's based off of this paper that, that's in the, the bottom of the, the slide there, written by Balzarini about feature point tracking. So it, it's primarily a two-dimensional tracking algorithm. And so the, the goal really becomes with these cameras that are so sensitive, with the 95% efficiency that have been tailored and are optimized for your experimental setups, to uh, to be able to give you more information from the from the information available to the camera itself to help you with the results to either a you know give you better image quality to help you with the large data management and so the prime BSI 
the Prime 95B and then EMC CD cameras uh, become the, the right cameras to use for the magnification of your experimental setup for the experiment that you're running. Um, and it just makes it simpler because it, it's less about the camera because the cameras are, the cameras are you know, nearly perfectly sensitive. But it becomes more about focusing on the rest of the experiment, the field of view, the resolution, the optics, uh, most importantly, the biology, right? That, that, that tends to be the largest challenge. And the cameras really are just there to, to help with the other aspects. You know, as I mentioned, improve the data quality, the management, and application-specific tools. Help you get more efficacy, better efficiency out of the experiments. Help you save time and get you better results um, simultaneously. And so that's, that's a bit of the direction where photometrics is going with our cameras. It's not just about introducing the most sensitive cameras available uh, and you know, taking 30 to 40 percent uh, improvement across across the board for, for, for with, or compared to FCMOS cameras, but also to help you with the experiments and to make to make the actual process of the experiment better. And so, with that, I'd like to thank you. Hopefully, this was a informative webinar and. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me. I, I do think we have some questions here, so I guess we can go through those. Yes, thank you, Ratchet, for your presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Ratchet Mohindra will answer as many questions as time permits. And the first question is, can you explain more on the impact of pixel size Larger pixel size has higher capacity, larger dynamic range, but not necessarily more sensitive or less noisy, correct? So that's generally correct, yes. Uh, the larger the pixel size, the larger the typically the capacity for that pixel to be able to hold higher levels of signal. Um, so yes, you do get more dynamic range out of it. Uh, but it won't, as you mentioned, it won't affect the noise of that pixel. That will really come down to the design of that specific pixel. And whether it will necessarily be more sensitive or not, again, will come down to whether it is a back illuminated pixel or not. To, to give you a bit of a comparison point, the front illuminated SCMOS cameras with the same pixel size, uh, 6.5 micron, had a full well or pixel capacity of about 30,000 electrons. The same pixel size, 6.5 micron, with the backside illuminated uh, sensor on the prime BSI has a full well of, of about 40 to 45,000. So you're seeing not just an improvement of sensitivity, but about a 30% increase in the well capacity, even with the same pixel size. So while the pixel size will have an impact on you know, the, the dynamic range and the amount of signal you're able to measure, much of it also comes down to the ability of the, of the design of the pixel and how much pixel well it is designed for. How does the BSI compare to the sensitivity of an EMCCD when the BSI is binned 2x? So uh, this is one of the questions that uh, I, I had a feeling would come up. Um, because they're both backside illuminated uh, pixels with the 100% fill factor, um, it would compare very, very similarly. Now, the advantages that the BSI, the prime BSI, or the binned 2x2 two two pixel would have is simply that when binned, it, has a, it, it becomes a 13 micron pixel, so 13 microns by 13 microns, while an EMCCD pixel is 16 microns. Oh, so, so sorry, what I mean to say is the EMCCD pixel would still have a bit of advantage there just because of the larger pixel area. The EMCCD will also have the advantage because the minimum noise level tends to be less than one electron. So you would be able to, to detect dimmer signals with the higher image quality, but anything more than about 10 photons to about 10 photons or so, you would get a better better result with a binned 2x2 two two, uh, pixel from the backside illuminated uh, prime BSI. 
the, the only challenge there becomes with the optics that you're using. At 100x, you would be spatially subsampled, and uh, you would need a higher magnification to, uh, to, to kind of counteract that. But yes, that's definitely an option. But generally, we find that when optimizing for the optics, the 95B tends to be the better option for 100x, while an unbinned uh, prime BSI tends to be better for 60x. Off of the last year or so of having both you know, EMC CDs and the Prime 95Bs, what we found is that the results of the Prime 95B when compared to EMC CD cameras tends to be uh, significantly better. And we found that a, a large portion of the user base is switching from EMC CDs to the Prime 95B, the larger pixel backside illuminated camera. The next person says, very good presentation, very informative, and nice presentation. Thank you. And their question is, is the camera application limited to microscopy? Can you comment on the application to low lighting, to low lighting imaging, surveillance, autonomous cars, long distance imaging, telescope? Uh, yes. So is it limited to microscopy? Definitely not. Right? It, it really becomes what is required for, for your application and what, what, the, what the necessary performance requirements are. And so can you use it for surveillance in autonomous cars and long distance? Yes. The, the challenge will become, if, if you take uh, you know, long distance imaging or telescopes, for example, they typically tend to use much longer exposure times. And CMOS technology uh, isn't really conducive to that. But if you need uh, high-speed acquisition uh, with that maximum sensitivity, for any of these applications, it becomes a viable solution. If there are no more questions, I would like to once again thank Ratchet Mohindra for his presentation. Do you have any final comments? No, yeah, I think everything was great. Thank you for the questions. And again, if, if there are any other questions, you know, feel free to get in touch with us through the, through the website. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. We would like to thank our sponsor, Photometrics, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. This webcast can be viewed on demand through June 2018. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Just want to add that we have another person who commented, agreed, fantastic presentation. Thank you. Um, so until next time, goodbye. <laughs>